Today, I would like to talk about something that is extremely important in general, but specifically to our Sangha. So let's see what we can do about keeping our ears open and our hearts open. And when you hear a teaching, it is important to hold your mind and your heart in a certain way. Uh, I like to do like this kind of mudra, where you're holding your hands in the shape of a bowl. And so it reminds you, it, it's not necessary to actually do it, but for me it reminds me to hold my mind like a bowl, like a bowl that's not cracked, hopefully we're not cracked, uh, or a bowl that's not turned over so that whatever nectar just runs right off of it, or a bowl that has some poison in the bottom in it, like judgment or attitude, and then when you mix the nectar, it's no good anymore. So we try to hold our minds in a perfect bowl, perfect bowl for holding whatever blessing we are about to receive. And we also should remember the motivation for receiving a teaching, for doing one's practice, for contemplating a teaching, <clears throat> for hanging tankas, for cleaning altars. These are all merit-gathering things that we can do. And what is the attitude that we should have when we are engaging in such activities? Well, the attitude that we should have is that we are doing this for the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings, for their benefit. Even in the case of a monk or a nun wearing one's robes, doing uh, practice or doing duties at the temple, if we lose the habit of doing these things for the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings, eventually those habits will dry up. Uh, and the dynamic nectar blessing of those habits will dry up, and then the habit will dry up entirely. And whereas maybe in the beginning of practicing, if we see an altar with some dust or something's not right, we could quick clean it off and we're very conscious about that and we make sure that the stupas are in good shape and so forth. But then when we are no longer doing that with the right motivation, maybe we're thinking, oh, I'm a monk or a nun, so I better do it. You know, with that joylessness or with that eh, intention, kind of so-so then eventually the habit will dry up and we'll lose focus. And the, we won't even see what's wrong anymore because we've developed the habit of passing it by. And that's really important. That's really important because that discernment is essential for further development on the path. Otherwise we become stagnant, we sort of go back to sleep and we become like those little Buddhas on the altar who are with their eyes closed, and that's a reflection. The most important thing that we should remember then is our motivation. Why do we do these things? Why have we given our life like this? Well, we do this because we have seen the nature of suffering and we've seen enough. It's not hard to see it. It's in the paper, it's in our world, it's in our lives, and it's in our minds. And so, with the smallest effort, we can see. And our other motivation, once we establish that we are doing what we do for the sake of sentient beings, should be stabilizing, gathering, and increasing the stream of merit. And that's what our teaching is going to be about today, is the importance, the relevance, and the profound necessity of maintaining one's stream of merit. Unfortunately, in our society, we are groomed to think that the most important thing is something material, like having a good house, or having a good job, or having a, you know, a good marriage with proper people, or you know, good stock, or whatever. Um, having a fabulous career or, you know, I, different families guide their children in different ways and some families don't guide their children at all. But 
generally we are taught that what is most important are the material things. And even if they're um, not strictly material, we might think that the most important thing to have is a stable uh, marriage or a stable family relationship. Even if it's not, you wouldn't say that's strictly material, but it's material in an emotional sense. You have to have something. It's a thing that you must have. And so that's how we're trained our whole lives. We are trained that really each life is another step of gathering something. But we're never taught, literally never taught in this culture, about how important it is to gather merit, or even what merit actually is. When we are taught about merit, the closest thing we come to in our society is whether we are good boys and girls or bad boys and girls. And, for instance, in Western religion, we think, I mean, we, as children, we are taught that there's a book somewhere. You know, when you get an X in the bad side and you get a check on the good side, and that someday it'll all get read. And then what? I don't know, somebody pops you on the head or <laughs> throws you into a dungeon. I don't know what. But... It's not my specialty, that kind of thinking. <laughs> Although I see it everywhere, and I recognize it when I see it. So, and that's how we think about the stream of merit. But actually, to strengthen and establish one's stream of merit actually has to do more with, how can I say this? Well, it has to do directly with the five senses. Coming and going, it has everything to do with our five senses, how we perceive the world, how we are able to move forward in the world. And of course, all of this is dictated by the five senses. Now, this is going to get a little deep here, so bear with me. All of the action and reaction that we experience in our lives is fed to us through the five senses and how they habitually engage in the world. You have to think of it this way. Do you remember when transistor radios first came out, some of you? Maybe not all of you. Okay, there's a couple. I remember with my little nine volt battery holding it up to my ear trying to get sound, moving from wall to wall, you know, and hearing all, oh, but for the first time I could hear all kinds of music on that little radio. I remember hearing Wolfman Jack and <laughs> messages from the end of the universe. I mean, that was just something. These people were speaking a language that touched my heart, and yet I didn't know what the heck they were talking about. Ah, oh, woo with Wolfman Jack. What was that? <laughs> but it was fabulous. And they were just, uh, oh, it was just wonderful. And I even heard symphonic music, all kinds of stuff through my little transistor radio. But then when I actually got older and I was able to afford music, then I actually heard what music actually sounded like. Of course, it was only vinyl, you know. It was uh, records, but I had records and a decent stereo, and that's another step in your life. Records and a de decent stereo. Now it's CDs and a, different, and a decent player or, or your iPod, which I have graduated to. <laughs> so, but think of the difference in the quality of sound. What if you could only hear through that transistor radio, and that's what you thought music was? You would act much differently be much differently, be much different in your ability to be receptive, it would affect you much differently. You would pursue it much differently. Like, I was a nut for music, but I know a, a lot of kids that just couldn't get, it was just too hard to hold the thing up to your head, and it was too hard to keep buying that radio battery every week with your allowance. And so some kids caught on fire, I think, and some didn't. And thusly, as adults, some people really love music and some people like music or just don't think about it that much. 
So that's just, a good, I think, an example. The transistor radio representing the tinniness of our own five senses when we are not able to perceive through a stream of merit that is deep and vast and profound. The difference in hearing might be listening to that tinny transistor radio or hearing an actual symphonic orchestra. Whoa, what's the difference? Well, it's huge. And, and you can hear things that you couldn't even hear or detect on the other level. That's a great metaphor for our senses and how if we engage in meritorious activity, if we are shepherds and caretakers of our own mind and, and work with our mind constantly, not taking any crap from it, <laughs> Training ourselves, training ourselves, training ourselves to contemplate and to discern what is to be taken up and what is to be abandoned. That kind of contemplation is a great restorer of merit. The way that the path appears to us, the way that it actually seems, changes according to the stream of merit that we have stabilized and given rise to. How can you accumulate merit? Oh, I've given these teachings so many times, I wonder if it's uh, useful even to give it again. And I see the faces that you know I've given it to before, but I will give it again because I want to be sure that there are no mis that you have that skill and there's no mistaking that you have that skill. And that this is the jewel in the palm of your hand. The method by which you can accumulate merit. We will go over how to accumulate merit through making offerings, through meditating, through contemplating. You can almost write the list yourself, but we'll go through it. But what I'd like to talk about first is what happens when merit diminishes. It's funny how we don't act as though we believe in cause and result. Because in fact we actually do, in some ways. But only when it suits us. For instance, we think, I know I'm going to live a long time because there's nothing wrong with me that would kill me right now. Well, I know that that's not the case. I know that each and every one of us, from the point of view of karma, when we give rise to the karma that allows us to be born in this life, at the same time, the karma is there for us to die in this life. Now, the Buddha has taught this. This is not news. What has a beginning has an end. What goes up must come down. Newton knew that one. <laughs> so we know this to be true and yet we act like we don't. We think, um, okay, everything's okay because I don't see, I don't, I'm not bleeding. And even the medical profession reflects that. If there's nothing catastrophically wrong, then there's nothing wrong. And we can't, you know, you can't fix it. But by virtue of the fact that we are appearing in phenomena as sentient beings that have a beginning the cause for our death is already there. I, I know of cases where the cause of death is unknown. This happens a great deal, more than you think. More than you think. I mean, we have to put something on the death certificate, but in many cases, the cause is not known. And I have actually known of people who were on the path and then somehow the merit diminished and they were gone and then they were dead. And uh, the one case that I'm thinking about was somebody a long time ago in Michigan. Um, and, uh, that uh, well, there was no cause. 
and from what I understand, the woman was at the beach, and she suddenly said, I don't understand what's happening, and then she died. So, and there was never a cause. They, they put something, but, you know, I'd have to write something down, but there was never a cause. And so that's a way for us to understand how immediate, how, how sudden it can seem when the merit to be alive in this form, on this path, suddenly ceases. It seems immediate, and it must have seemed immediate to this poor woman. It certainly must have seemed immediate to her family. But as a teacher, perhaps it was possible to see, at least in hindsight, everything that happened that led to that moment. Something subtle in the mind that turns away, that closes the eyes, that maybe doesn't take care of the altar, or doesn't do this, doesn't do the other thing, and then doesn't do this. And Really, you're not doing anything wrong. You're just not doing things that you used to do that were right. And then suddenly, because you never know when that balance is going to go over to one side like that, suddenly the merit is gone. And then there is a sign like no longer engaged in the path. But if you, if you think that you're doing it of your own volition and that you're making a choice or a non-choice, if you have that delusion, you won't know that you're on your way to the merit being lost. But they call that the stream of merit is diminishing when that happens. And the lamas always say another thing. They say, if you invite somebody to an empowerment and they simply can't get here. They try a little in their way. You know, it's always in their way. And, and, but they have reasons, lots and lots and lots of reasons. And every time you bring up more inviting or beseeching, more reasons come. And then, of course, phenomena will roll in and help. And then it's, the, it's just not possible. Well, the lamas say, leave it. Go away. Leave it. Because if you try to force that person to come, some terrible obstacle could come. Not everyone has the merit to continue. And the reason why this is so important is because it isn't something that we're doomed to experience. You know, that someday, poof, merit's gone. Oh, too bad. Now I can go to another life and just eat candy or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's not like that. We, we like to think that salvation is going to come from a piece of candy or a pill or, you know, something from the sky or whatever. But in fact, it's all up to us. And we are the only ones who can increase our own stream of merit. And we are the only ones that can increase that stream of merit for others. It sounds like it's a funny dichotomy, but it's really not. It's really not. Now, we should never enter into any kind of relationship, spiritual or non, thinking that somehow being with this person is going to increase my stream of merit automatically. That is the fastest way to, loot, to lose and use up your merit, is to make someone else responsible for it. The signs of losing one's merit or of having the stream of merit dry up are not that hard to see. You give rise to pride. You give rise to anger. You give rise to non-virtuous thoughts. You seem to be stuck in them. That's less a sign of some mental condition than it is a sign of not, not growing your stream of merit. Because one's mind stream is very dynamic. If you stand still, you're behind. Do you understand that? If you're not going forward, you're moving back. So to increase the stream of merit is essential every day, every moment. 
And I, you know, I'm a Westerner, just like you guys, fundamentally, although I'm a little, little centered in another culture as well. I'm a Westerner, like you guys, and I have the same ideas, like, Gee, what I really re need right now is a week at the beach. You know, that's really what I need right now. Um, and then instead, you take that energy and you do something like, did what we, say for instance, do what we did with the temple yesterday, just fixed it up. I don't need a week at the beach anymore. <laughs> I feel great. I woke up with a song in my heart. And, and I'm, I've, I've tested this theory many times for myself in my lifetime, and I've lived long enough to do it, where it's the stuff you think makes you happy sim simply doesn't. It just doesn't work. It's like bashing yourself at a br against a brick wall every single day. <laughs> After a while, you're like... <laughs> doesn't work and yet and it's but it's why is it so hard for us to realize that to do the right thing to build merit is the thing that fills your mind up with nectar and it and the best thing it does is take your attention off your own neuroses which is just ah I don't want to be in your head you know what I'm saying it's just Oh, it's hard to listen to you guys sometimes, and even myself. So, rather than thinking in the old way, that maybe what I really need, need is what I always get for myself, more peace and quiet, that's what I need, or another TV, or, you know, something, something, something. That's what I need. Maybe it's time to switch from that kind of old, non-productive, pointless, circular, bashing against the wall kind of thinking into something that actually works for you. Wouldn't that be something? Regarding the connection between the loss of the stream of merit and one's own death, that is the cause of one's own death. There is only one cause of death. Whatever the appearance is, could look like cancer, could look like heart attack, could look like anything. But there is one cause of death and one only. And that is that the stream of merit for this lifetime has dried up. That is the cause of death. Because when there is no merit, you literally cannot take another breath. And for those people that are put on some sort of breathing machine, those are the people that will not wake up. And it's because the stream of merit is gone. Now there are other things that happen as well. When the stream of merit is diminishing, <clears throat> our mind starts to go a little wobbly. And what happens is that we get into um, let's see, how would you put it, like ritualized coping mechanism kind of thinking. You repeat things again and again, but when you really, if you have something left by which you can examine your thoughts, you realize something's not right here. I'm just, I'm, I'm really, I'm playing a game. Something's not right. But most of the time, by that time, you're gone. And the best chance you have is that you have a wisdom friend, such as a guru, a teacher, <clears throat> who can walk up to you with a club and smack you upside the head, karmically speaking, and say, yo, wake up. You have gone. You are somewhere in Timbuktu. You are down in the South 40. You are out in the rain, and you don't even know it. And of course, that's where, if you have the good fortune, any good fortune left, that's where the relationship with the teacher comes in, and they'll pick that karma. If there's anything, if it's way back in the background, and you would normally have not have gotten to that merit in this lifetime. If you have a, sol a relationship with your guru, and you have that commitment in this lifetime, lucky you, then the, the guru can just like 
stab it, bring it forward, because the guru has lots of merit. Otherwise, they wouldn't be the guru. In order to be sitting on this throne, being recognized by one's teachers, being put in the blah, 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 you know, then there has to be a great deal of merit. Um, so, you can pull that merit, merit forward and you can just like kind of um, suppress the non-virtue and bring forth a better stream enough to plant a suggestion or to try to turn the tide or to say, no, go that way or go that way, you know, that kind of thing. If that happens, take the advice. You know, how can I say this? Can, how can I jump off this throne and say it to you so clearly that you really, really get this? If that happens, take the advice. So it may be the last call. And so that is the great, amazing love between the guru and the disciple, the commitment, the life after life holding is based on that. You may not have even have done anything in this lifetime to deserve that. Like it's come from way back in your karmic stream. But that's the blessing of having a teacher. And that's why nobody makes it on the path by themselves without a teacher. Because you don't know when, you've, when you're drunk and stumbling out in samsara. You don't know. So when that call comes and you have been told come back. You better listen, better listen quick, better listen honest, dedicate the merit immediately. The best thing you can do is make an offering in gratitude, a flower, a scarf, anything, and dedicate the merit to the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings. Why? Because even if you screw up after that and you say, you know, I don't think I want to listen to this, you've already dedicated the merit, and so it's in the bank can't spend it now, it's in the bank. And you have a little bit to work on. That's how fragile it is. It takes so much merit to be happy and to live a meaningful and profound and worthwhile life. And yet that's the only way to accumulate more merit, is to live a meaningful and profound and worthwhile life accomplishing meritorious activities. When the merit starts to, is, uh, is starting to, uh, the stream of merit is starting to dry up, we have mental aberrations. Our mind changes. We don't think the same way about things anymore. Things that were precious to us are no longer precious to, precious to us. Conversely, when we increase the, um, the merit, the mind changes in completely the opposite way. Natural joy comes up. It is a natural joy. It seems to be baseless. And so you wonder, in a way, when's the other shoe going to drop? Because I'm just naturally happy right now. <laughs> the things I thought I needed, I don't have them. But I'm still naturally happy right now. So what's that all about? Well, that's, that's a good flow of the stream of merit because it's the stream of merit that is a bountiful, relaxed, open, positive, dynamic flow. It's a big yes in your mind. And that's kind of what it feels like in one way. You feel like some, the door's open. You feel like you're flowing. It's happening. It's yes. There's not the, the tendency to go, well, I do a little merit over here, but then I, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer a flower at the temple, but over here I'm going to be a real asshole. <laughs> mm. That's not what I'm talking about. When you know you've really got it going, this natural happiness arises. And you begin to see things differently, and the eyes are different. Now, you can't fake it, so I'm not going to tell you what the difference in eyes is. Well, I'll tell you a little bit. You see colors differently, for one thing. 
Now, if I tell you this, somebody, I know, someone, somebody's going to say, I think I'm doing it. I can see the colors. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's your heart that changes most of all. When you have a loving and giving heart and you really want to help, you really want to be there, you feel like you've got something to give. And the result in happiness from that indicates that you have a good, huge stream of merit. That's the stream of merit that the bodhisattvas have. It doesn't decline because they're always increasing it. For instance, it would seem that I went away from here and went to Sedona. Well, I didn't exactly sit around and eat bonbons all day in Sedona. I did build a stupa. I did start two nonprofit organizations. <laughs> we did a few things. We saved a lot of lives during Hurricane Katrina. <clears throat> it's that kind of activity that continues. Even in a, that would be my off time in my life. And that's what we did. That is cool, don't you think? Isn't that something? Why is that? Because I'm so great? No, it's habit. Life after life of habit. My habit is to increase the stream of merit for the sake of sentient beings. And so it happens whether I'm actively engaged or not. But now I'm here, and this is where the stream of merit has led me. Somebody must have been calling to me. Something must be right because I'm here and I'm home. And we're going to make this place stronger. So the one thing that I want to be sure, though, is that we never, ever, ever for a moment take that for granted. You must never say, oh, good, my teacher's here, or the temple's built, or we have a stupa, or we did our duties for today, and say, now that's enough, we're good. You should never say that. But it's not like you stress yourself constantly and, and do it neurotically where you're saying, Oh, I've got to get one more thing in today, otherwise I won't have a stream of merit. <laughs> we don't want you to go nuts either. It's not, that's not what I'm talking about. It's just that you look around, you think, I'm satisfied. This is good. Another door was opened today. Another yes in the world. Another sacred image. Today I did my practice. You know, I, I'm, I'm just, it's all good. And, and so that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling of benefiting someone, not that you yourself feel especially cozy and comfortable because here in your temple you did the things that you're used to doing so it was a habitual day. Not like that. A day when your eyes are open, when you can discriminate, when you see what's to be taken up, what is beautiful and gorgeous and sacred, and you see what needs to be cleaned up, what is messy and nasty and dirty, and you, and you just, you're alive. That tells you that the stream of merit is flowing nicely. And I'm not talking about mania, people. Because <laughs> that's the other extreme. That's when you are so out of it. And so not knowing that you're out of it. That you're just in a state of terrible delusion and confusion. I'm talking about something more genuine, more heartfelt, more true. You can look into the face of a person and see whether they have a good stream of merit going. You can see it in the mouth. You can see it in the eyes, most of all. You'll see it. There's something there that makes you want to get close to them. Makes you want to have a little bit. What is it? Can I just touch you? <laughs> it's kind of like that. When we start to lose that stream of merit, of course, we see the usual phenomena that we see in physical existence. We see old age, sickness, and death. And that is the end of the stream of merit for this lifetime. And you remember that you've been taught again and again, this is a precious human rebirth because you have found the path, you have found the method, and you have found your teacher. 
So this is a precious human rebirth. You don't want the door to close on this rebirth. If you had come back as a tarantula or something, maybe, you know, maybe it's time to move on. <laughs> or a rat. <laughs> so maybe it's time to move on, but <clears throat> when you have these precious things, you want this stream to remain as beautiful and as secure and as perfect as it can for as long as it can. And so your job, your only job in this lifetime, whatever else you have to do to keep food on the table, to keep a roof over your house, to help others, to keep things stable, that's just what you have to do. Your job in this lifetime is to increase your stream of merit. Can you give me a nod, make sure, hold up a finger, anything. Increase your stream of merit every day. Every day. And these are joyful activities. To make an offering, to offer prostrations, to contemplate the teachings, to help others, to save a life. Every time you save a life, you lengthen the lifespan of yourself. Every time. Especially if you do it with wisdom and understanding by averting obstacles. And of course, Dr. Mary will tell us there's, three, there's different levels of saving a life. You can do it by giving the right medicine. You can do it through human contact and through different kinds of therapy, or you can do it by averting the obstacles. Either way will work if there's any merit left to work with. So there are so many different ways to save a life. I feel like I'm in the business of saving lives, but I'm not a doctor or anything. I'm not even a very studied person, but I really work at this. You know, I try to take care of animals that are suffering. I try to alleviate their suffering. Uh, they are as important to me as they can be. They are sentient beings with the potential to be Buddha someday. Why wouldn't I care for them? They are senti sentient beings in the sense that they wish to be happy, just like me. Why wouldn't I care for them? And so, of course, I try to make them happy. <laughs> the... When it comes to the part in one's life where one has turned away or gone to sleep effectively, spiritually, whether one realizes it or one does not, then the stream of merit begins to diminish. And when that happens, the eyes begin to fail, the hearing begins to fail, the sense of smell begins to fail. The sense of touch begins to fail. And by the time we notice those things, it is very hard to gather merit. So why, while we are still vital and strong, and we still have our faculties complete, this is when we want to gather merit. And we should never miss the opportunity. Let's say, through some obstacle to our life, we break a leg. And that puts us in bed for a while. Maybe it's a bad break or something. And, you know, that puts us in bed for a while or whatever. Well, there's a couple of different ways you can look at that. You can go, oh, my God, my merit is... No, that wouldn't work. Oh, my Buddha, my merit is falling. <laughs> <laughs> it's that cultural slip every now and then. Yeah. <clears throat> and you can freak out and wish that things were different, but is that a very effective healing tool? Not really. So my suggestion would be to look deeper. Always you should look deeper. The deeper meaning, the deeper manifestation. Try to cut to the heart of it. What is it about this merit thing? Okay, now I have the merit to be in this path where I found my teacher and I have the method, but what is it about this merit thing? I'm laying in bed here. I can hardly walk. You know? Uh, or I'm getting old, or, or, or I, you know, what is it? I, I'm just here I am, and I'm just not getting it. Well, if you're in bed with your broken leg, the first thing to ask yourself is, where did this blessing come from? 
because this is a blessing in disguise. It's out with the old and on with the new. Sometimes we need events to recalibrate our existence. And sometimes it is actually the very blessing of the guru. So when we find ourselves in that position, we look to the heart of the matter. Look deeper. Don't look at just the little neuroses. Look and think, I'm here. I'm a, I'm a practitioner. I have met my guru. I am here with my guru. I'm learning the method. And right now, this very minute, I'm learning how to expand the stream of merit. And I can't walk around and distract myself too much. This could be a blessing. So in that way, you're kind of looking at the deeper level of some outward manifestation, not judging it on its surface. You see what I'm saying? So you look at it and you say, wow, this is a great time for me to learn how to say some mantra. <clears throat> This is a great time for me to study some teachings. This is a great time for me to take advantage and heal myself from the inside out by accomplishing this enormous stream of merit. And it's fairly simple. If you can create a simple altar and hobble over there, you can make an offering every minute, every hour. You can make mental offerings. I've developed the habit over years of whenever I see a beautiful scene, I notice that when when, at, like, um, when we see beautiful scenes as ordinary people, it's like we're watching TV. We, keep, we think, oh, cut, snap that picture. I'm going to keep it in my heart forever. You know? Cut, print. It's mine. But instead, you should think, this is so beautiful. I offer it as a crystal jeweled mandala to the gu bu Buddhas, the bodhisattvas, the gurus, and I offer it for the sake of the liberation and salvation of sentient beings. Number one, you'll really get to see how beautiful it is. Because it reveals itself to you. Because you're open and you're flowing and the nectar is sweet. But if you go cut, print, it's mine. I think that's the curse of photographers. You know, cut, print, it's mine. I get to keep it. But that's not the way. That stream of merit should always be increasing. And that is one method to do it. I'm not saying you should stop being a photographer. Uh, but I'm saying that to use that method of offering, to see phenomena as only that, what else is it? It's just phenomena. So to see phenomena as that, and to always remain mindful of one's own dynamic, quiescent nature. That which is invisible and yet utterly profound. To be in touch with that, to have your finger on that kind of like just a light touch on the pulse. I know you. I remember you. I, you know, even if that's all you can say is, I know that nature. I remember that nature. That, that's okay. But to be mindful of increasing that stream of merit, that is the way. That's your job. That's your job on the path, how to spend your life. To go away and just kick around, you're hurting yourself. I can see that you all have hurt yourself. And I will smack you around for it. And why? Because I love you because I won't give up on you. I can see that there has been damage done, that some things are old and dusty and not right. But whatever I see, I'm going to try to change. And you must allow me that. If you are with me in any way, then you must allow me that, because it's my job. And so if I say to you, you're exactly wrong, you're delusional, you're crazy, and you've got to turn this around right now, please listen. Because you don't want to see the next stop on that train. We have to watch our stream of merit and protect it like it is our only treasure. It is the most valuable possession, if you can think of it as a material possession that you have, it's a little tricky when you do that because you think, I've got it, so it's there. But it's fluid, you know, like, 
like liquid it through your hands or sand through your fingers. You really have to work at that. And you really have to increase your merit every day. Because if you don't, mental distortions will happen. Unhappiness will happen. The mind will either become deflated and depressed and incapable the way older people do when they get dementia or it will become crazed and hyperactive and gimme 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 everything like a fly going not a, like a moth going for every bit of light you know what I'm saying just crazed like that that kind of mind makes no progress on the path either one they're two extremes either one makes no progress on the past whatsoever. I don't care if you're wearing your robes or sitting in the lotus position for 20 years. With a mind like that, you're not making progress. And so you have to increase that stream of merit. How do you do that? First and foremost, never, ever break Samaya. If Oh, it gives me the chills to even say this because I know this from the depth of my heart. Samaya is like the bowl that you can hold your merit in. It's a solid, pure bowl, and as long as you keep your Samaya, you have that merit. Samaya means commitment. And there are three levels of commitment, outer, inner, and secret. And out, a way of explaining the outer level of commitment it's basically the promises that you make on a simple level. Like, for instance, if you take robes and you wear the robes, then keep them purely. Don't let them lay around. Honor them. Keep them clean. Now, uh, when, when you're not wearing your robes, uh, like, for instance, your yellow robe, you put it on your altar and you thank you for this opportunity. Increasing merit. May I and all sentient beings increasing merit. <laughs> Have that opportunity in every future life here. Let me throw rice. Increasing merit. Get it? <laughs> Increasing merit. Okay. Then, uh, that would be an outward way of doing it. And like, for instance, you promise that you're going to do a certain practice every day. You do that practice. Even if you only do the bare minimal samaya, you do that practice. You do it every day. Because if you miss it, you miss a stream of blessings. You cut it. And, and you miss it. You, you, there was, you were hungry. There was a beautiful meal coming to you. And you just put shit in your mouth instead. Or you sewed up your lips. And you can't eat it now. So do your practice every day. Just accomplishing that brings happiness, I feel. So the outer commitments, we've made a commitment to keep this temple <coughs> by implication to keep it growing. We haven't kept that commitment very well. We've kept it barely, but what have we done? Well, you know, we'll, we'll get past that. So we have a little mixed merit here, but at least we've got a stream going. We can see that we're still together. We still have something happening. Now there's an in, the more inner level of keeping one's Samaya. Would be to keep Samaya with the deities that you have been given empowerment for. For instance, if you have received the empowerment for a deity protector, Mahakala. Mahakala has been, for me, been with me for lifetimes, lifetime after lifetime. When I was a young girl, I was brought up by uh, an unfortunate family with alcoholism and abuse and all kinds of stuff. And Mahakala would appear to me. I didn't know who he was. I called him my googly-eyed monster. He would appear to me with his giant googly eyes, which is probably why I love these dogs so much. <laughs> the giant, bulging, googly eyes. And uh, he had a staff and a bag, all the things that, you know. And he would dance with a rolling kind of dance. And I would tell him all my troubles. And he would roll louder when I would tell him about the bad stuff. And I just knew he was taking care of me. And uh, I always, it's a funny thing for a little girl to not be frightened by such an image. Because he is a very powerful protector. 
but I knew that he was my googly-eyed monster. He was for me. And so during times of great danger, I have seen him, I have known him, and when my mind was wrong, he has taken me to task. Oh, yes, indeed. Like one time, you want to hear about this? One time, I was sitting out in the hot tub that used to be back in back of the solarium, and I was having thoughts about things, as we all do. And um, there was a cactus out there. It was the summertime, and there was a cactus outside. And I know this cactus. I had them in Sedona as well. It's a tall column cactus with not many spikes. But once in a great while, in, at night, it will bloom a big white flower. Actually, it usually happens during the day, but that time it happened at night. It was sort of strange. So I'm sitting, I go out to the hot tub. Oh, it's a big white flower. Fabulous. I think this must be good. So I, in the presence of this big white flower, which um, uh, I remember there was a crystal I had put there too, and I had thought of Mahakala and dedicated it to him, but I'd forgotten all about that. So I was sitting in the hot tub thinking, well, ordinary thoughts. Delightful little ordinary thoughts, <laughs> but ordinary thoughts nonetheless. <laughs> about things I could have and what I could do and blah, blah, blah. You know, the stuff that we all share as human beings. We are all human. And then all of a sudden I got out of the hot tub and I'm in terrible pain in places that I can't mention. And I go to examine and I have cactus spines where I never touch this cactus. This is a personal story. Get it? <laughs> I was full of them. It was horrible. I had to go inside and save myself. I really had cactus spines all over me, and I got it. Whoa, I just left. I thought, well, it's okay to go out in the hot tub, but you don't have to lose your mind while you're out there. <laughs> So I still enjoy a hot tub. I have a wonderful hot tub, but I've trained my mind a little better these days. I'm older and wiser and not as stupid as I used to be. <clears throat> and I do watch my mind. I've trained my mind, and through teachings like that, I've been taught again and again and again that it's not that you can't have your own thoughts, and it's not that somebody's going to get you if you have your own thoughts. It's just that it was a wonderful way instant karma could show me cause and effect. You know, think like this, and, and it, there's, there's just not a good result. And I just got it. I got it. And I just, it was one of those things that makes you fall down to your knees and in gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. What did you just save me from? I have no idea, but I bet you did. I feel that. Blessing. That was a blessing. And so many times I've had uh, blessings like that from, say, Mahakala. Why was I talking about Mahakala? Your guru right, right, right. Oh, your guru deities. And then, so, when you receive uh, an empowerment from a deity, thank you. Gosh, con continuity. <laughs> when you receive an empowerment from a deity, that deity becomes personal to you. It's like um, more than a social introduction. You know, it's, it's a very personal thing. And so that's your... That's, your, uh, that's an inner samaya. You keep samaya with that deity. You make an offering every day. And even if you can't, for, inst for instance, we received some of us the Rinch and Terzad, how many deities in there? So many deities. We couldn't possibly keep samaya commitment with every deity by doing one full mala of their mantra every single day. I mean, we would do nothing else. So what we do then is to keep samaya with our main deity and a main protector. So that's how we manage that. We understand, we move to the understanding that all deities are the same. But then even when you do think of, say, Manjushri, or White Tara, or Green Tara, or Seymour, or the other deities of whatever uh, category, that you think, these are uh, heart friends of mine. These are, these are in my heart. You know, you don't think, I have them. You think they're in my heart. That is like an inner samaya. But the most important samaya that one keeps is twofold. Is it is the recognition and respect of one's root guru through everything and anything. 
whatever it looks like to you. That is the toughest Samaya. It is the deepest Samaya. And you must never abandon it or all is lost. The Samaya with one's teacher is the same as and not separate from the Samaya with one's own fundamental nature. Because to recognize one's root guru without deviation to know that whatever that root guru looks like, whatever they're acting like, if they are on that throne and have been recognized and are authorized and they are the ones that hooked me onto the path, that is my root guru. And that Samaya must be kept. And through that, through that, Samaya to the other gurus that you have contact with. But it is through that root Samaya with one's root guru, which is the same as the root Samaya that you were born with, with your own nature. You see? That is the door of liberation. Literally, that Samaya is the very door of liberation. So if one's root guru becomes secondary, like you think, oh, I like that other guru better. If that's your thinking, you have lost the path. No matter what practice you are doing, you have lost the path. If, on the other hand, you see your root guru as the door to liberation and you go through that door and you find more. You're on the path. That's beautiful. That's right. That is appropriate. Because the purpose of that door is for you to go through and find more. But if you have that door closed, then the Samaya is broken. It's very delicate. That Samaya with one's root guru is like is like a bubble, so delicate. It's like the wing of a butterfly, that if you touch it, it breaks, so delicate. That the best way to handle it is with your very breath. It's so delicate and so precious to you. How can something so delicate be so precious? Well, that's the way it is. And so one's root guru is the ultimate Samaya indistinguishable from the Samaya that we have taken on to wake up. And so that is the most secret level. The outer is the form, the inner is the method, and the secret is the essence. And that is the essence. Now, it's not always easy because even the kindest, most magnificent guru is human. And they can pass wind or, heaven forbid, say something unkind to you, you might think. Although it ends up, if your Samaya is kept, it's the kindest thing that will ever happen to you. Or they can can get in your face about something and, and of course we don't like that. We want to turn away from it. We don't like to be spanked. We don't like to be told that we haven't been right. We want to cope. And so we often turn away from the very blessing that would save us at that moment. But what I'm here to tell you is that that stream of merit that must be preserved is so intimately connected with how one keeps Samaya. <clears throat> what are the other ways to keep that stream of merit going? Save lives. Many animals are tortured in horrible ways. You know that because people are not kind. When we received the animals from Katrina, so many of them were just devastatingly abused. I mean, unbelievable. My own Maggie Gumbo, that's her name, um, she, her teeth were filed down so that 
Fighting dogs could train on her, and she wouldn't be able to hurt them back. As a puppy, they were filed down. You can see all the insides of her teeth. Someday we're going to have to start pulling them out. Can you imagine that? She was used as meat. Oh, she's a happy girl now, though. She's a happy girl now. We can't imagine the kinds of suffering that animals live through. And, and, and why? Because, they're, because they can't fight back, because they're afraid, or because we want to eat them, or wear their fur, or you know, wear their leather. It's uh, un unthinkable. So we have this opportunity <coughs> as humans in this world to gather merit by kindness towards others. And by making offerings and dedicating that offering to those whose minds are so dark and closed that they can't make the offerings themselves. Maybe you uh, offer a flower and, and just, you know, I offer this for the sake of so-and-so, may he, she find his way to the path. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and most of all, may I never be separate for the path. May I return in some form that I can bring others who have not found the path to the path. May I myself do this and this in every future lifetime. Prayers like that must be said every day. These are prayers that create the stream of merit, that make for a glorious life and for future glory as well for oneself and for sentient beings. May I be there for their sake in every future lifetime. May I be the tree under which they find shelter. May, be, may I be the bridge over which they cross. May I be the food that they eat. May I be whatever they need for the sake of sentient beings. And then make that offering with your full heart. That is increasing the stream of merit. To contemplate the teachings in such a way that they become deeply understandable to you. Not, um, oh, I have to do my contemplation today. But to contemplate them in a way that one is thoughtful, the mind is juicier, you know? You, you, you let your mind be moist and flexible um, with, with the, the sweet nectar of true contemplation. You know, and to, to recite the prayers, even when your lips don't want to move, even when you're falling asleep in your chair, to still recite the prayers, even when you're down on yourself because you're thinking, I'm doing a really crappy job at these prayers. Take happiness that you have done them at all and be satisfied and be grateful and commit to doing them better next. But keep that samaya because I promise you, even if you don't do the prayers as beautifully as you'd like to, you've done them, and that's something. Never let your lineage down. Never let your teacher down. If you make a promise, keep it. Don't learn the hard way how painful that can be. Because you were born to your family, and we know it's a mixed bag. I certainly know I've had that experience. I have been fortunate to have a beautiful family that I've gathered around me, but my original family was not all that great shakes. So different people have different experiences, but I have come to understand that the true family is the Dharma family. There is no doubt that our goals are the same. There is no doubt that we have the same father. And indeed, we, our father is none other than His Holiness Pena Rinpoche, Guru Rinpoche himself. And who is our mother? She is Tara. She is Mandurava. So we are a family. And His Holiness never, t never misses the opportunity to remind me whenever he thinks about, you know, events in my life, whenever I've told him things, he always says, never forget that Payul is your family. Life after life, Payul is your family. And for that, on this day, in this year, in this life, I can only swear to you that I am so grateful. So grateful. And I will do anything for this holy family 
and I will do anything for you so long as you stay within this family and stay on the road with me and continue to gather merit for the sake of sentient beings. Through practicing, through praying, through offering, through saving lives, through teaching if you are able, or through gathering knowledge and contemplating it till one gets to the point that one can teach. Otherwise, life is a waste of time, and you're just out there. Have, over the past couple of years, haven't you noticed that a lot of people are kind of just out there? And it's not a judgment thing, kind of just lost, kind of just not finding their way home. And we know that the world at large is on a terrible path. I mean, there is war in the four directions, everywhere. The, cause, the causes for World War III have already been done. When you want to call it World War III is up to you. The suffering that has been caused, and even we used to be the good guys, we would never start a war before. Now we've started one and many deaths have occurred and there is more and more suffering. Now we know that this is the time that the gurus have talked about. This is the time of terrible darkness. And there is much to do on every level, outer, inner, and secret. Outwardly, we should vote. <laughs> we, should, we should speak up. Open our eyes. Take part in this world we're living on and increase our stream of merit while we do it. Inwardly, we should pay attention and be willing to grapple with the idea that things aren't going perfectly and we'd like to learn this before we just drop dead so that we can help. And most especially on the most subtle level, now is the time to pray for the liberation and... and, and salvation of all sentient beings and for the end of war, for the end of suffering, for the end of it all. Now is the time to pray and to reach out in whatever method you have. You know, teaching isn't getting it fast enough, so I'm going to try singing. I'm, I'm going to try everything. I'm going to take up drumming. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'll find a way. And you should have that same idea with me. That's, what we, that's our job. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to give up until we can make a difference and to make this world a better place. Now's the time to pray, to stick together, to look at each other and say, we are Vajra brothers and sisters and we're still here and that matters. Let's make a pact today to let every day count, no matter if it's a good day or a bad day, if we get stuff, we don't get stuff, we're sick, we're well, it doesn't matter. This very day, every day, we will increase the stream of merit and offer that bounty, that nectar, to the end of suffering. No. Julie.